the deterioration of Hawking's body didn't stop him making another scientific breakthrough. At that time, black holes were thought to be bottomless pits, with gravity so strong that nothing, not even light, could escape from them. But Hawking proved this was not the whole story. Something was escaping. The simplest way to think about this is, is to think in terms of little particles just outside the edge of the black hole, the horizon it's sometimes called. And what we know is that gravity, the energy of gravity, is so strong outside the black hole that it can be turned into particles from Einstein's equation, e equals mc squared. But the laws of quantum mechanics tell you you can't make one particle, you have to make pairs. And if they're just outside the black hole, one of them can fall into the black hole and heads down towards the famous singularity. But the other one can scoot off into space and disappear out into the universe at large. Now, it's carrying with it some of the energy that came from the black hole. And because E equals mc squared, it's carrying some of the mass of the black hole. So the black hole, according to this image, gets smaller and smaller until eventually it becomes too small to be a black hole and explodes. And it's always radiating away these particles, which are the Hawking radiation. This radical new idea, now known as Hawking radiation, caused a sensation in the physics community. It was a small step on the road to finding the holy grail of physics the unified theory. Einstein searched for it, Hawking is still searching for it, a single law that would explain how the whole universe works. As a first stage in unlocking it, physicists must combine the two laws that explain our universe, relativity describing the very large, time, space and gravity, and quantum mechanics describing the very small, atoms and molecules. These two theories are usually quite distinct, but Hawking radiation showed that at the edge of a black hole, they do work together. Linking different ideas in physics is, a, is an important thing because people want to have this ultimate theory, the theory of everything, the ultimate answer. Starting from the Big Bang, you could, in principle, they hope, explain everything that's happened since in this mathematical way using equations. You could predict the existence of stars and planets and people by knowing what happened in the Big Bang. Hawking radiation also got him noticed beyond the narrow world of physics. In the late 1970s, black holes were sexy. People latched onto Hawking as the guru who could explain the mysteries of the universe. He began appearing in newspapers and on television. His physical appearance and the way he talked about big ideas in a witty and accessible way made him unforgettable, even though he had to use a student to interpret his failing speech. You wouldn't see anything special if you passed inside the black hole. But once you pass a certain critical point, then you'd never be able to get out again no matter how much rocket power you used. Stephen was very lucky in being the right person in the right place at the right time. Science, in some way, uh, has become the new religion, that people are looking for ultimate truths. They had lost God, and they were looking for something to replace God, and they hit on cosmology and black holes in the universe, and then they found a person who could represent the entire community of cosmology and, and astrophysics and so on to them. We all came out of a singularity. the Big Bang Singularity at the beginning of the universe. So it wouldn't be that unnatural if we all ended up in another singularity. You could say dust to dust and ashes to ashes and singularity to singularity.
For years, the Hawkins managed without nurses, just Jane, his secretary, and students caring for him on a rotor. But now, with a third child, Timothy, the family was under increasing pressure. Hawking's motor neurone disease was atypical in that its progress was so unpredictable. He had already exceeded all expectations for his survival by more than 20 years. But in 1985, on a working trip to Geneva, Hawking caught pneumonia, something that frequently kills people in his condition. He was on a life support machine, unable to breathe unaided. To save him, his wife Jane gave permission for a tracheotomy operation, which would allow him to breathe through a hole in his windpipe. But he would pay a high price. Although at first he didn't realize it, the surgery that had saved his life meant he would never speak again. Hawking faced a future essentially trapped inside his body, barely able to convey even his most basic needs. When I had my trichostomy operation in 1985 and lost my voice, I thought at first that I might get it back eventually. But in the meantime, I desperately needed a way to communicate. I couldn't write or use a keyboard. All I could do was raise my eyebrows when someone pointed a letter on an alphabet card. And he was furious, you know. He, he was very furious indeed, because now he couldn't talk at all. So they were communicating with him, partly by his eyebrows, very communicative eyebrows he's got, and partly by a sort of board where you, uh, you say, is this the right one? And very, very slow means of communication. To while away the long hospital hours, Hawking's friends and students read to him from whatever newspapers and books came to hand. I remember this particular chapter, it involved one of the characters going into a, into a sort of a sex club or something and watching some pornographic movie. I remember saying to Stephen, um, Stephen, I don't know that I should be reading this in front of all the nurses here. Do, do you really want me to, to carry on? And I remember Stephen uh, sort of gave a little mischievous grin and sort of nodded his head and his, his eyes sort of regained their sparkle. And I, and I always think to myself, that was the point when I, I knew Stephen was going to make a recovery. As he was getting better, he was sent a software package from America that allowed him to operate his computer using a single switch. When connected to a voice synthesizer, it let him speak at about 15 words per minute ten times slower than normal speech. Hawking could now communicate more clearly than he had done for years, but in a voice robbed of personal expression. When he first had to start using a computer, it must have been very distressing, and uh, I think it was with some reluctance. But the fact is that I think, realistically, in a way it may have been a blessing, because at, by that time, his voice was so weak, even before he'd been ill, that he was having to repeat statements so many times in order to be understood, even by his close friends and associates. Ironically, the electronic voice that showed no human emotion was to give Hawking his first chance to build a relationship with his younger son, Timothy. For the first five or so years of my life, I didn't really get to know him as a person just because I couldn't understand what he was saying. I knew he was my dad but never really bonded with him at all and I could actually start to speak to him when he got the voice box. We managed to build up a bit of a relationship from then on, you know, he'd take me uh, to buy ice creams and we'd play Monopoly together. It's just ironic that it was through the voice of you know, someone else. <laughs> that enabled me to build up a relationship with him.